The Portuguese were among the first explorers in many parts of the world, even the most remote, such as this small island off the west coast of Canada. Rocky Sampson and Jessica Casey are joining others at Reed Island today to celebrate the memory of an ordinary man who led a very extraordinary life. This man was Rocky's and Jessica's great-great-grandfather, José Silva, who came to be known as Joe Silva, or simply, Portuguese Joe. The last half of the 19th century was a time of people on the move. Many, mostly men, came to North America looking for a new life and adventure. A few of them not only prospered, but also became famous in their own right. This is the story of such a man, a fisherman of very little education who didn't speak English, but still played a pioneering role among the first wave of European settlers in British Columbia. He survived incredible hardship in one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. He traveled halfway around the world from a tiny island to end up on this tiny island. This island to me, it's home. I've heard about it all my life from my grandmother and my grandfather and the story of Portuguese Joe that she told us. I'm just overcome with emotion and gratitude to be here. This island connects both sides of my past, the Portuguese and the First Nation side. It is a very spiritual place where we connect and it is a place of beauty. Rocky and Jessica are native Canadians proud of their Aboriginal status and equally proud of their connection to Portuguese Joe, whom they consider a true hero of the West. Portuguese Joe's contribution to BC history is so important. We are here today to honor that and to keep his memory alive. We wish to help tell the story of Portuguese Joe so that he can have honor and respect and official recognition as any other British Columbia pioneer. Great grandpa built this dike. Many are the descendants of Portuguese Joe interested in helping tell the story of this man. Marie Gabera is one of them, and for a good reason. I'm the oldest living great-granddaughter of Portuguese Joe, and being born and raised on this island, I've always felt honored because of the full history of Portuguese Joe himself. Behind you was Grandma's kitchen. Ah, favorite place? Yes. As the oldest living relative of Portuguese Joe, Marie Gabera still remembers many of the stories her mother told her about Joe Silvi and his life at Reed Island. About how he and his second wife Lucy settled here in the early 1880s and raised 11 children. He was buried on this island and quickly forgotten by everyone except his ever-growing extended family. Many of Joe's descendants, like Rocky and Jessica, try to keep his memory alive by making pilgrimages to this very special place. Since the early 1980s, these descendants return faithfully every year on Mother's Day. They tend to the graves and the modest stones that mark the final resting place of their ancestors. Every year, we, uh, my husband and I and my oldest brother Jack and his children, we come and clean the cemetery. and We've been doing it for 25 years. I feel proud to be here and working around his uh, grave and uh, due to the fact that he's responsible for my, his son and my dad and now us. Yeah, I say when I'm cleaning the graveyard, well, you know, it, it gives you a good, better feeling to yourself, you know, because uh, one day I might be there. So, you know, so uh, I like to see that carry on the tradition like that, eh? <laughs> We are unique in the way that we're combined of, of Portuguese and native all the way through. All the grandmothers being native and being how Portuguese Joe ended up here on the island. Uh, you know, he had left Gastown with his family and he had raised his family here up till my father's generation. And now I like to bring the children back here and involve them in every part, whether it be a burial or just a cleanup. And it's a happy day for us. You know, we're, we're, we have a picnic, we come by boat, it's an event that we look forward to all year. Today, as part of the celebration, the ashes of one of Portuguese Joe's granddaughters are being buried here. It is yet another display of family pride and desire to keep the Sylvie name forever attached to this island. We're here putting our mother's ashes to rest. 
between her parents. That would be my grandma and grandpa, Domingo, and Josephine Sylvie. And Domingo is the uh, son of Portuguese Joe. I feel pretty small, pretty insignificant, but at the same time, I feel very proud that I am part of his heritage. It's an, an amazing story and an amazing man. Who was this amazing man? How did he survive a childhood at sea in such cruel and miserable conditions? What kept him alive in a job so dangerous that claimed the lives of his father and his brother? What kept him going, surviving and flourishing? The answer may lie in his place of birth. Joe Sylvie's story begins here, a dot in the middle of the Atlantic, Pico Island in the Azores, was in mid-19th century a world away from anywhere and everywhere. This is the village where Joe Sylvie was born. Today it's a modern and prosperous place that still retains the old world charm of the days when Joe was here. You can still find the kind of stone houses where Joe grew up. Homes as simple and solid as the Portuguese settlers, who spent centuries stubbornly clinging to life, trapped between the side of a volcano and the edge of an ocean. It's a geography that shaped their character, creating industrious, independent people who were faithful and loyal to family and friends. Every single day was a struggle for survival for the Sylvies. Education and childhood were luxuries they couldn't afford for Joe, his brother and sister. Almost from the time they could walk, they worked from dawn till dusk. They all had to do it just to have bread on the table the next day. At night, the children would listen to intriguing tales of adventure. It stirred up fantasies of water and boats that could carry them off to a better, richer world on the other side of the horizon. One evening, Joe's father told them about an American whaling ship which was arriving soon at Orta Harbor in the neighboring island of Fayel to take on provisions and men. This could be the ship that would transport them to a new life. Young Joe, like his father, dreamed of going away to the sea, to escape a life without much promise or future, an existence so dreary that he was willing to do the unthinkable for a child, agreeing to be separated from his mother in his place of birth for a very long time. Meados do século XIX, as condições económicas no Pico eram extremamente difíceis. As pessoas não tinham dinheiro, não tinham emprego, trabalhavam de sol a sol, viviam a 10, 12, 14, 15 pessoas numa casa, numa casa pequena, de, de, de paredes de pedra seca. As pessoas subsistiam, sobreviviam, digamos, de forma miserável, de forma quase infra-humana, ainda por cima aterrorizadas com uma, uma natureza uh, hostil. E, portanto, a baleeira é a fuga, a baleeira é o sonho, a baleeira é a partida, a baleeira é a hipótese de a pessoa se autonomizar, a pessoa determinar o seu futuro, alcançar um patamar de vida com dignidade, coisa que o Pico não oferecia, nem os Açores ofereciam no século XIX aos habitantes que cá viviam. At the age of 12, Joe's life changed forever. Facing a future of hardship and little hope, his father felt he had no choice but to break up the family. He took his two boys whaling, leaving Pico Island, their mother, and childhood behind forever. A decisão destes homens partirem nas baleeiras é uma decisão que eu diria uma decisão profundamente dramática, às vezes trágica, com contornos de tragédia, porque era, uma, era um salto muito desconhecido, 
um salto no abismo, no escuro. Adeus parceiros das farras. Imagine-se o caso de José Silva que sai com o pai e um irmão rumo ao mar e à América do Norte e que deixa sozinhas a mãe e uma irmã. Eu imagino o luto, a dor, o sofrimento que esta gente fica na calida de mesquim à espera de uma coisa que não se sabe o que será que vai acontecer. Meu coração como louco quer desgarrar-se do peito. No one knew. No one could have imagined what was about to happen. The life and destiny of the Sylvies would alter dramatically. The romance of the seas was about to become a decade of tragedy, turbulence and peril for a young boy named Joe. In 1849, the Sylvie men boarded the American whaling ship Morningstar that had arrived from New Bedford on its three-year journey to the Pacific and back. It was a long and peerless journey for any man, let alone a child of 12. Whaling itself was very hard work. Life on board was nothing short of hell, according to stories left on the ship logs. Life below deck was miserable and indescribable. 15 to 20 of us jammed into a dark, stinking wet hole with barely enough room for our bunks and sea chests. It was hot, black and slimy. You couldn't escape the smell of smoke, grease, tainted meat, dirty ruffians and seasick Americans. One can only imagine what it must have been like for the Sylvies, and in particular for Joe, the youngest and most inexperienced of the three. Only his courage and determination would explain his survival. Bom, não há dúvida nenhuma que o Joe Silva foi um homem que foi criado no ambiente do mar. E, portanto, ele ir para o mar e enfrentar as dificuldades do mar, isso era praticamente o ambiente normal da vivência dele. Claro que neste caso, na Caça da Baleia, ele tinha que ter muita coragem, ter uma coragem tremenda por ir por esse mundo fora e enfrentar e comer pão que o diabo amassou. E o João Silva também comeu pão, muito pão que o diabo amassou. During the long voyage, and in spite of all the hardships, it appears that this young boy named Joe would prove he was as capable and mature as man twice his age. Evidence shows us that Joe Sylvie was a very bright man. He was a hard worker and he knew his business. He pursued his business. That sort of alacrity and intelligence would be respected on shipboard if he kept his, uh, if he, if he kept his work to the work of the vessel. And I would have no doubt that Joe Sylvie did that. Few but the Portuguese could survive the inhumane working conditions. Portuguese sailors were treasured for their tireless work and their fierce loyalty to crew and captain. Because they could not speak anything except Portuguese, they were less likely as well to jump ship in foreign ports. These Azorians were superb whalemen. There are two ways about it. Uh, they, they stuck to the ship. Uh, they, were, uh, they were good workers. They had a tendency to stick together in the forecastle. There was a, a Portuguese community sort of among Portuguese sailors on shipboard. For Joe, the call of the sea, however, was becoming more and more of a nightmare. His life on board harder and lonelier. The hardship at sea would claim his father, a victim of a heart attack, and his brother, who died in a whaling accident. The legendary tolerance of the Portuguese was no longer enough to keep Joe Sylvie at sea. After nearly a decade, Haunted by the deaths of his father and brother, Portuguese Joe was growing weary of the unrelenting misery, the hopelessness, and dangers of whaling. Intrigued and increasingly tempted by tales of untold riches in the gold fields of California, Portuguese Joe Silvi and his crewmates would finally slip away into the night. They jump ship somewhere on the west coast. There's no documented proof of exactly where or when, but it is known that sometime in the late 1850s they began a new life on the run. 
The gold fields were already playing out in California, so they decided to head north, looking for gold over the border in the Fraser River. Eventually, they ended up in a native reserve at Musqueam in southern British Columbia. No, we don't know where or when Joe jumped ship, but we do know that he was probably heading for the gold fields. And he never, never, and he never make, made it. You know. He kept. Uh, Jessica visits the Musqueam Reserve with Jean Barman, historian and author of 96 books, including one on the remarkable adventures of Portuguese Joe. There's considerable difficulty in pinning down most aspects of Joe Silvey's life. He was not literate, he didn't read or write himself, and we have to depend on the stories that other people have shared through time about him. One of the most important ways in which we know about Joe Silvey is through his eldest daughter, Elizabeth, who was born in the 1860s. And in old age, she spent a lot of time talking to the city of Vancouver archivist, Major Matthews, and told him everything that she remembered about her father and her family. All that is known for certain is that Portuguese Joe and his fellow deserters were cured of gold fever somewhere on the Fraser River. Alarmed by stories of hostile natives, they turned back and paddled straight into more danger. Too exhausted and hungry to go any further, they put their lives in the hands of natives on the shore at Musqueam. One of the stories that survives is that Portuguese Joe was returning from the gold rush when he came about, uh, across a group of uh, Indians at the mouth of the Fraser River. And he was afraid, he didn't know what was going to happen, but discovered that he was being treated very warmly by Chief Capilano and was welcome to stay there for the night and then stay there for a longer period of time. Intrigued by the friendliness of the great chief and entranced by his granddaughter Kaltinat, Portuguese Joe would stay here to live and ultimately make her his wife. I don't know about uh, too many uh, others other than like Portuguese Joe, but I know that he did marry into uh, 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 a lady from Musqueam here uh, briefly. And uh, I'm sure uh, that in our culture and our history, the, the, the elders of our communities they just don't let uh, their ladies or whatever the hierarchy in our community marry anybody. So he had uh, somebody. They had to be somebody special to have uh, to allow that to happen. With a new life, a new wife, and growing family, Portuguese Joe, an illiterate whaler from the other side of the world, was about to become an important pioneer and businessman on the West Coast. His world travels had ended but his problems and new adventures were just beginning. Still in his early 20s, Joe Sylvie didn't know it, but he had come ashore to stay. He had found a new home in a place he'd never been before. In the rest of his life, he would never travel more than a few miles from this spot. Now he had to confront his new reality, making a living as a stranger, speaking a strange language in a strange land. He had to resist the urge to take flight again. With no business experience and still unable to read or write, he fell back on one of his greatest assets, the Portuguese determination and ability to cope with anything. He built a crude log home in Point Roberts and opened up a small store providing goods for passing gold miners. He became self-supporting by hunting, farming, and fishing for food. He had tireless energy and also discovered he had untapped instincts for business. Selling lamp oil extracted from sharks and dogfish, he made more than $2,000 one summer, a small fortune back then. He turned his new wealth into more property and in 1867, he became the first Portuguese in Canada to become a British citizen. Still illiterate, he proudly put a simple ax on a deed to property on Galliano Island. It made him the first Portuguese landowner in the west coast of Canada. 
for Joe to have done this indicates a lot of resourcefulness and a lot of entrepreneurship on his part because it was essentially a British place and here was someone who was Portuguese who still probably knew Chinook but likely didn't know much English to take these kinds of initiatives and it suggests something about his character I think that he had a very strong character and a lot of determination. It's believed there were about 15 to 20 Portuguese in the area at the time. He joined with other Azorian immigrants to introduce modern whaling techniques. They replaced traditional harpoons with explosive rocket heads and created a thriving industry. They harvested the plentiful whales in Howe Sound. Boiled down, they produced up to a thousand gallons of oil. It sold for up to 50 cents a gallon. The development of oil from the whaling that he did, and then subsequent to that, the development of the same net in the salmon fishing industry completely changed that industry at that time. All of these things um, were Joe's contribution to the economy of British Columbia, moving it from a cottage industry to an industrial age, and, and that completely changed the province of British Columbia. Joe, his wife Kaltenan, and two daughters, kept moving all over Burrard Inlet while he was fishing and whaling. This, however, was not to last. The discovery and development of oil wells in the U.S. reduced the demand for whale oil. The decline in profits and the seasonal nature of fishing brought Joe to a new business and a new, rapidly growing community. He came to a place called Gastown that eventually would grow into Vancouver. There, Portuguese Joe developed into one of its first businessmen. He opened a saloon, the hole in the wall. It catered mainly to mill workers. Portuguese Joe was one of the first businessmen here in Gaston, in this city, and I think he should be recognized. Rocky meets in Gastown with the Portuguese Council General in Vancouver. Like many others, he is proud of Joe Silvi's contribution to the development of modern Vancouver and the province of British Columbia. José Silva, also known as Joe Silvia. He was definitely uh, an important figure in this, uh, in this city. He was one of the first Europeans uh, to colonize this, uh, this territory. Uh, he was a whaler by excellence, and uh, he knew uh, techni uh, techniques uh, for fishing, and he, did, uh, he produced oil out of uh, fish for the industry, uh, and um, he also um, uh, had uh, direct uh, involvement with the uh, First Nation uh, people living here, which, um, which uh, I think he was very important. Portuguese Joe should definitely be recognized as one of the important um, people in this, in this city, at the beginning of this city. We have to do something about it. We would like to have something like this statue uh, dedicated to him. I think it's time that we turned attention to more of these people who came before. Dr. De Abreu is not alone. Professor Jean Barman also in the early agrees. In the 1960s, at the time of the gold rush, there were two saloons, each on one end of Water Street. One was Gassy Jack Dayton, who was a nice man from Britain. The second one was Portuguese Joe, who was from Portugal. We have a statue in Gastown today to, Gass to Gassy Jack Dayton. Why don't we have a statue to Portuguese Joe? I obtained Joe Silvi's parents' names from... Manuel Azevedo is a lawyer and researcher of Portuguese history in Canada's West Coast. He too believes Portuguese Joe should be officially recognized. Azevedo says this beach in Vancouver's Stanley Park, where Joe once lived, should be named after him. This in recognition of what he considers to be Joe Silvi's most important legacy, the way in which he dealt with the native population. I think Portuguese Joe's contribution to British Columbia, like many other Portuguese, is one of tolerance and uh, convivencia, living with the other, respect for the other. The Portuguese men all took Aboriginal wives and uh, raised family of mixed race, uh, which I think is part of the Portuguese uh, heritage of our tolerance for the other. 
I think that's the real contribution of Portuguese George, the humanism. He showed the Aboriginal people that all, not all the whites weren't exploiters and you know, to the, the, destroy the Aboriginal culture, but enriched it. While Gastown was about to mushroom into the modern metropolis of Vancouver, Portuguese Joe would not stay around to see it. Fate and tragedy were about to take him in a different direction and to a different place. When the colony of British Columbia became a province in the Dominion of Canada in 1871, Joe Sylvie was among its most prosperous citizens. He was a fisherman and saloon keeper who refused to trust or accept money. He insisted on being paid in gold or silver. His hard life had never been better or happier. And then suddenly, it changed dramatically. In the year 1871, Joe Sylvie's wife, Kaltanat, caught what was described as a cold in her back, possibly pneumonia or pleurisy. It proved fatal. Devastated by the death of his seemingly healthy young wife, left alone with two young children, Joe sold his bar to loggers. He moved to Brockton Point in what would one day become Stanley Park. He opened another saloon. He also built his own boat, the Morning Star, the first fishing vessel built by a European in British Columbia, and went back to fishing. Joe also returned to married life. When Portuguese Joe's first wife, Keltinot, fell ill and died, he was left, uh, the stories that survived tell us, very upset, very distraught. He had two young daughters. He had to make a living from the sea. By this time, he knew that fishing was the occupation that he wanted. And so he did need, and it was, it was the practice of the period, he did need to find a second wife. And very fortunately, uh, he ran into a young woman at Seashell named Lucy, who was already educated, and they were married in a Catholic ceremony a few years after Caltanot died. Portuguese Joe's first officially registered marriage occurred on September 20th, 1872. As a wedding gift, Joe Sylvie had a photograph taken with his new bride, a native seashell known as Lucy. After the marriage, Joe continued to fish and move all along the BC coast. He became the first person to have a sane net fishing license. The size of his fish catches became so legendary, they were often reported in the local press. Cousin Rob, here in Egmont is one of the places that Portuguese Joe rented nets to the Indians, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. He and his boys would also fish around here, they'd catch herring, salt it, and sell it for up to $150 a barrel to schooners that stopped for supplies and repairs. Robert Silvey is one of many hundreds of native British Columbians tracing their heritage back to Portuguese Joe Silvey. Like his cousin Jessica, he lives in the Egmont Seashelt area, home of Joe's second wife, Lucy. Joe himself fished in these waters. He was attracted by all the large, easy catches. He was also captivated by the natural beauty of the place that probably reminded him of the island he had left behind in the Azores. As in Portuguese Joe's time, many fishermen still make their living off the calm waters of the Egmont Inlet. One fisherman who lives and works here is Bill Griffith. He is a friend of the Sylvie family. He's also a great admirer of the work ethic of Portuguese Joe. He didn't get rich. Fishermen don't usually get rich, but it's a way of life, and he, uh, he had a good life. He did things the way he believed they should be done. That doesn't always make you richest either. When you're ethical and have your beliefs and do things the way they should be. <laughs> so uh, he was a pioneer in the fishing on this coast. Robert Sylvie, who at one time used to work in Bill's fishing vessel, visited him today. In true Sylvie fashion, he could not resist offering to mend some of the nets kept in the shed, another reminder of his ancestor's legacy. Portuguese Joe was the first person to have seine license on this, on the west coast here. And uh, he would teach the native women how to, to make the nets, and he would also 
show the men how to use them. And his techniques are still used here today. Meanwhile, at home, Joe and Lucy began what would become a very large family by today's standards. Back then, nine or 10 children was fairly normal. Joe's family was still growing and so was the town and not always for the better. British Columbia was becoming very British with old world values and prejudice against anyone from a different class or culture. At the time that uh, Portuguese Joe had his children by Kel Keltinot and then later he would have another number of children by Lucy, it was a very fluid period of time and British Columbia had people from all over the world. But increasingly as uh, British Columbia became more of a Canadian colony, the notions of what was proper and what was right tended to be very white, very Canadian, very British. And here was Portuguese Joe, who had essentially two strikes against him for his family. The first was that they were Portuguese, which by this time is a small minority. And secondly, that uh, they were Aboriginal through their mother. And I think he probably was aware of this, if we judge by his actions, in deciding that he is going to leave the emerging young city of Vancouver, and he is going to find them a place to live, which is um, going to protect them from the outside world, and he does. Always independent and protective of his clan, Joe sold off his home and saloon. He set off in search of what would become a safe haven for his children and a final resting place for himself, his family, and his legacy. Reed Island is a little bit of West Coast heaven tucked in between Salt Spring and Galliano in the Gulf Islands. It was here, in 1881, that Joe Sylvie bought his first 160 acres. He built a home where his children would be safe from the growing threat of bigotry. A decade later, he and his son Domingo managed to buy the rest of the island. Portuguese Joe came from the Azores, came from a small island in the Azores, and he then found his own island. And I think that he, in a, essentially, it seems to me this is a deliberate action. He had been a fisherman. He understood the nature of British Columbia with all of these islands along the coast. He found an island that had not yet been claimed by anybody, and he made it his own. Wherever they lived, the Sylvies were self-sufficient, farming, hunting, and fishing. All the Portuguese Joe's sons eventually went on down to be the boat builders and fishermen that they became. And they all followed along that same line. Fishing tradition carried right on down to the grandchildren. The greats all went to the sea. Well, so many of them, they had, their, they had their own boats, the captains of their own fishing boats. One of my uncle Jim, one of my uncles, Jim, he built a boat right here in Reed Island. Beautiful boat. She was a 38-footer. Joe's children would even grow up and build their own school for their children. On Reed, Joe created for his 11 offspring the kind of perfect childhood he had never been able to enjoy. Joe's family life at Reed Island, however, was not always idyllic. There was always tragedy and heartache. From my mother, I heard about the misadventures of the Sylvie family, a daughter that was kidnapped. Marie and other elders pass on the tales of misery that are so common in any family. One daughter was kidnapped or eloped. A son was murdered in cold blood in a payroll robbery. Another descendant was drowned, amazingly the only one of nearly a hundred of Joe's children or grandchildren to die in the sea. In 1974, the Sylvie's last hold on Reed Island disappeared when failing health forced one of Joe Sylvie's grandsons, Joe, to sell his property. We bought the property in 1974 from Bertie's oldest grandson, uh, Joe, Joe Sylvie, who's named after his grandfather. Joe had lived here all of his life, and uh, they had split the island into three sections. Uh, the three older boys, uh, they, they gave her land to the boys, not the girls back then. And uh, Joe was one of uh, the brothers that stayed. He uh, stayed and lived on the land where the other brothers had sold their land off. Oh, wow. 
When Barry sold his wireless technology and internet business in Vancouver, the Bradshaws became one of three families that are semi-permanent residents here on the island. They identify closely with Portuguese Joe's desire to move to Reid. I think we came here for much the same reason Portuguese Joe came, is that he, he wanted to get away from the infrastructure of the city. And uh, so we come here, we, we have no water, we have no uh, electricity, we, we have to be self-sufficient. And uh, Joe was very self-sufficient, he was very innovative. And you'll find people who come to these remote islands have much the same spirit. We came here to stay, but it is their place still. Old Lucy put her mark in this place, and it keeps popping up in little uh, patches of little flowers. And as you look over here, you'll see there's little bits of, I can see little bits of Lucy all the time when I'm digging around in the garden. I didn't plant that. It must have been something that she put in. And uh, so it's, it's a fun thing. And I, I'm so proud to be part of the Porti, Portuguese Joe history. Like the Bradshaws, the neighbors are proud of the history that surrounds them. They all consider themselves guardians of the island and often get together to celebrate the spirit left behind by Portuguese Joe. We didn't know about the history when we moved here, but what we feel, I think, mostly is that much more the custodians of the land. I mean, we came after Portuguese Joe and the whole movement that came, came the family that came there, and we do feel very much that we're custodians of the land. In growing up around the campfires and reading stories on the, on the island, we've always known about Portuguese Joe, and, 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 and what the wonderful thing is, Every year we're learning more. Today the Sylvies are gone from Reed Island, but their presence still remains strong. This is still a very special place for all the many families that trace their ancestry back to Reed Island, Cultanot, Lucy, and Portuguese Joe. It remains a magnet that pulls Sylvie descendants back to Reed in their quest to maintain the legacy of Portuguese Joe. Portuguese Joe had been healthy all his life. It is reported that in the fall of 1900, he caught a chill while fishing for salmon. He became quite ill, and even though he recovered, a year later he suffered a second attack. Joe Sylvie died on January 17, 1902. According to his wishes, he was buried on his own property at Reed Island. The birth date on his marriage certificate stated he was only 64, but most felt he was at least 10 years older than his legal age. 64 or 74, it didn't really matter. He squeezed more than one life in those years. Lucy would survive another 32 years on Reed Island, watching her family grow and grow. It is estimated that today there are well over 1,000 British Columbian natives who are direct descendants of Portuguese Joe. Each year, the Sylvie celebrate their heritage reflect on the contribution of Joe Sylvie to their lives, mourn the loss of elders, and rededicate themselves to the struggle of bringing greater recognition to Portuguese Joe, their beloved forgotten pioneer. This year's pilgrimage to Reed Island is very special. We have a large amount of family from all over British Columbia's coast. We have honored guests. We have Jean Barman, the author of Portuguese Joe's book. We also have the residents who honor and just love Portuguese Joe and the stories that they know of Portuguese Joe. For this year's family gathering at Reed Island, we are honored to be joined by a group of Portuguese Canadians from the West Coast who have come to celebrate Portuguese Joe's life, to honor him as a man, as a pioneer, and to remember with the family what he meant to all of us. He's to a key 
com o grupo de Chamarrita dos Amigos do Pico. Estou muito satisfeito por estar cá uh, uh, neste evento, que uh, foi de, um, de uma pessoa do Pico que veio para aqui nos 1850 e que foi muito, uh, tem um valor grande para a província da British Columbia. E que espera, não é? Nós estamos aqui também para entregar uma placa que veio da, das lajes, da Câmara das Lajes do Pico e que foi feita por um artista picoense. Esta placa é uma, é uma maneira do Conselho de, das Lajes do Pico honrar o português Jó. Eu costumo dizer que um homem inteligente no Pico é inteligente em qualquer parte do mundo. Sarah Santos, the mayor of the municipality, had wished to be here to present the memorial stone on behalf of the town where Portuguese Joe was born. Given the difficulty of such a journey, she offered to honor Joe Silvi by joining the people from the town to reflect on Portuguese Joe's legacy. The Açorianos começaram há 500 anos, quando começou o povoamento da nossa região, começaram por ser uma mistura de várias culturas e vivemos com isso ao longo do, dos séculos e também vivemos com isso na imigração. E eu acho que isso é uma marca que, que os Açorianos se calhar têm, que é a facilidade e, e a inteligência também com que lidam com, com culturas diferentes e que faz com que hoje em dia haja mais descendentes açorianos em todo o mundo, espalhados por todo o mundo, do que propriamente até nos próprios Açores. De modo que esta, esta iniciativa, esta história do Porto de Esquise de Joe é muito, é muito simbólica para nós, porque no fundo ele simboliza um herói da, da imigração. Here we are, great, great grandpa Joe. We have traveled all over the coast to gather here in your honor. The home in Reed Island that you have created is not gone. It's still here, in each and every one of our hearts. We carry what you have created with pride, dignity, and love. Part of me was scared to come here today to visit your grave, to meet you in a way a man I've heard about all my life. I wasn't sure how I would feel, but I feel at peace, at home. Everywhere I look, there is a silvy face looking back at me. And although I'm meeting some of them for the first time, they are all familiar to me. I've seen faces like theirs my whole life, and they have all come here for you. Proud, proud to belong here, to stand here as your great-great-granddaughter, and to have the honor of covering you with this blanket. In my culture, the Coast Salish culture, to be wrapped or covered in a blanket showed a person's wealth and prestige. Thank you for all you've given us, our sense of self, our family love and pride, and our rich history for all generations yet to come. My gift to you is a dream catcher, a circle that has no beginning nor end. Just like your descendants, we go onward, spreading to all corners of the earth and find gossamer strands to make a web. Our promise is to keep your stories alive. Your love and honor stood the test of time, for we are proof of a good life. Thank you for everything we call family. Thank you for being you, Portuguese Joe. For the relatives gathered here, this is a pilgrimage that will never end. Retracing Joe Silvey's journeys leaves everyone to wonder how fate plays such an important role in people's lives. Where would they be if Joe's father hadn't taken his child to sea? Or if Joe hadn't had the courage to jump ship and seek his fortune?
Carrying Portuguese Joe's legacy is a mission that the Sylvie family and others have taken upon themselves. Portuguese Joe's story has inspired not only the descendants of the great man, but also many of his countrymen living today in Canada's west coast and across the country. All those present in Reed Island today came here united to show appreciation and give thanks for Portuguese Joe's life and the valuable contribution he made to British Columbia and the whole of Canada. It's as important in the Portuguese Canadian community as among his many descendants that Joe Sylvie be no longer Portuguese Joe, the forgotten pioneer, but Joe Sylvie, Canadian pioneer, remembered and honored. <laughs>